Good morning, Dog Nation. I am Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. We are presented today by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. We're happy to have you with us. It's going to be a fun show for us. Spring practice getting rolling. There is something that you won't hear from Georgia spring practice that I think creates a little bit of a mystery for us in our minds that if we could know this, we probably can't, but if we could know this, boy, wouldn't it be interesting? I'm going to explain more about this here coming up and draw a contrast between Georgia and one of its chief competitors for the national championship here in the process. Also, big talk already out there about one of the big games for Georgia this upcoming season. We'll tell you more about that over the course of our time. John Stinchcomb joins us today. We'll get kind of deep into a lot of the spring practice stuff as it relates to Georgia there. And uh, a little bit of backlash out there, if you will, to uh, one of the big pieces of proposed news that came out the other day. We'll talk more about that. And we'll celebrate the fact that the Diamond Dogs right now are about as hot as it gets when it comes to college baseball. So it's all on the table for our program today, and we're glad to have you with us for it as we get it rolling. Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia, and it begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Pella Window and Door of Georgia, viewed to be the best. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. So let me walk you through my thought process a little bit for our conversation here this morning. I've been spending some time this weekend, like a lot of you probably have been, just sort of scrolling through different things and, you know, looking at the roster for Georgia. We've obviously got spring practice going here this week, and I'm just like all of you. A, I'm really excited to have football back, and B, I think you're probably like me on this. I think I really like this team a lot. And, you know, you think about, like, the big questions that need to have answers and the, the the concerns that you might have. You know, we've obviously addressed some of those kinds of things, and those are real and they're legitimate in any year in which you don't win a national championship when you sort of conclude, like Georgia did in 2023, with some so-called unfinished business. That probably does put a little bit bigger spotlight on some of your issues moving towards spring practice. We don't deny that. But my gosh, we'll do more of this with John Stinchcomb here coming up in a moment. When you think about the roster depth that Georgia potentially could have, the way in which it sort of supplemented its already, you know, prodigious talent with, you know, high, you know, profile transfers in some cases, it just seems like this could be a really, really fun and really, really interesting team. And over the course of the next few weeks, I really obviously look forward to talking to you about that. And yet it also occurred to me as optimistic as I am about what I think that Georgia might be here this year. I don't think I am anywhere near as optimistic as apparently one of Georgia's top competitors for the national championship this season. The team that has probably gotten more buzz during the off season than uh, Georgia has the buzz. They are creating themselves as kind of bullish as I am on Georgia's chances here this year. That pales in comparison to what one of Georgia's we'll call them rivals necessarily, but certainly competitors, what they are saying here right now. And I want to use this, both to draw a contrast between this team and Georgia, but to also set us up, talk more about Georgia here today. There's a website that covers the Ohio State Buckeyes. It is called 11 Warriors. And we talked about one of these quotes of the day during our cruise around the SEC segment, courtesy of Royal Caribbean. But I want to look at this a little bit larger right now because it's a part of a growing trend there in Columbus where the Ohio Ohio State Buckeyes are apparently feeling very, very good about themselves for the upcoming reason. Let me show you a little bit of this on the screen here. So 11 Warriors, the website, the headline is, we have to go big or go home, and we're not trying to go home. This is Tyleek Williams, a defensive tackle for the Buckeyes, who made the decision uh, to come back for the upcoming season, saying that he returned to Ohio State to compete for a national championship. Now, inside the story there, 11 Warriors, there's the quote from Denzel Burke. Now, we talked about Burke the other day. Uh, because Burke is saying that the 2024 season for Ohio State is national championship or bust. Well, then Tyleek Williams, the defensive tackle, took it even further because, look, I told you, I like what Georgia brings to the table, and I think that Georgia has a chance to be really good. But Tyleek Williams is taking that to an entirely different level when it comes to his opinion about Ohio State for the upcoming season. This is what Williams tells the 11 Warriors. I don't want to hype our heads too much, but I look at like we're a legendary defense. <laughs> Don't you love the idea that he's like, listen, I'm going to keep this calm and sort of stay in the pocket here for a minute, but we are legendary. We're going to be a legendary defense. He goes on to say, we got playmakers everywhere. The guys we brought back, we're all dominant. So I feel like as a collective unit, we're going to be like unstoppable. 
So there you go. Ohio State, who obviously is feeling it right now because Ryan Day is probably on the hot seat. Um, Michigan is the national champions. Ohio State really hasn't won anything of note in, in quite some time. And so that pressure, the energy that comes from knowing you need to win now is apparently creating a lot of boasting there around Ohio, Ohio, Ohio State. And the honest truth is the last couple of years, they knew they needed to improve defensively. For the most part, they've kind of done that. Adding Caleb Downs obviously uh, helps some of that too, that Ohio State's certainly not a bad you know defensive team. Uh, we don't dispute that. It's a little bit weird that a guy's going around saying, we're legendary, we're unstoppable. That is some very, very big talk, even if we agree that the Ohio State defense is probably pretty good. In fact, right now, kind of a weird reversal of fortune, Ohio State's defense actually this past season was probably better than its offense was, a complete reversal from where things have been you know, a couple of years prior to that. So this is not really an Ohio State topic, though, because the thing that comes to my mind is you would never, and I mean never, you guys already know this, you would never hear anybody from Georgia talk that way. Nobody from Georgia will ever talk that way. In fact, spring practice would almost be more interesting if they did. If Georgia players walking around saying, oh, we're unstoppable, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Uh, but we know that's just not how Georgia goes about its business. And the reason why we know that that's not how Georgia goes about its business is because Kirby Smart sort of sets the tone for the program. One of the uh, famous things that Smart has said in the past is we do our talking with our helmets, whether it be in response to something that someone else has said or just in terms of predictions for the upcoming season. Uh, this is not what Georgia does. Georgia doesn't boast openly. They don't go around bragging like that. Uh, they, that's just not what they do. But it does lead me to wonder about something. While Georgia would never be like uh, Tyleek Williams is, talking about this kind of stuff publicly, thinking we're that good and saying that out loud, it does make me wonder about a little bit of a mystery around the program, which is I wonder how good they think they are privately. As I said before, I was looking at the roster and looking at some stuff like that, reading some stories at dognation.com, and I just came away thinking, man, I really like this roster. I really like this team. I really like what they have a chance to be. And you're left to wonder, I, I wonder what Kirby Smart thinks about that. I, I wonder if Kirby Smart privately, in his private conversations and in his private thoughts, I wonder if he thinks that Georgia can be as good as I think. Because the one that we have some evidence of, from our own show even, is that sometimes – the private conversation that Kirby Smart has is a little bit different than the persona he puts forth publicly. Smart, obviously, in his press conferences, would seem to, at times, try to reveal as little as he possibly can about his inner thoughts, about the workings of the Georgia team, about just really anything operationally about Georgia football. Smart tries to reveal as little of that as he possibly can, and obviously it's his prerogative to be that way. But privately, we're led to believe that Kirby Smart has very different conversations and is a lot more candid and is a lot more direct when he's speaking to his own players. And it leads me to wonder, we know what George is going to say publicly. They're going to toe the company line. They're going to be very, very sort of poker face. They're not going to reveal very much. But what's the private conversation like around Georgia football? Let me give you some kind of evidence to sort of back this up and, why, and discuss why it's interesting. The other day we had a couple of former Georgia players on. They're teaming up to kind of help promote a big event taking place in Athens in April. You may remember this. One of those guys was Josh Moran. Josh, sort of a fascinating story of a former walk-on who uh, was at Georgia for a while and tried to go to New Mexico State, ended up finishing his career there at Delaware. A really interesting guy. And Josh was sort of talking about having come into Georgia in Kirby Smart's first year in 2016. You'll remember that as an 8-5 and five season. A lot of folks were wondering, you know, what is Georgia football going to be? You know, you know, had to go to the Liberty Bowl, play TCU, a very different game against TCU that year the one that would take place a few years later in the second of Georgia's back-to-back -back national championships. But while all of this was taking place, Josh revealed to us on our show the other day about how privately Kirby Smart's confidence was a lot higher than sometimes he was letting on publicly. I think this is really interesting. This is what Josh Moran said Kirby Smart told him way back then in 2016. I actually remember our first year, we were at the bowl game. We were in Memphis, mm -hmm. and um, I hopped on an elevator, and Coach Smart was on there with us, and he said, boys, we're going to the national championship next year. And so I knew after that he was extremely serious about making this a contender and it being a contender every year. Think about the contrast there on that for a moment. In 2016, a lot of folks were wondering, should Georgia have even hired Kirby Smart? And this rookie head coach with no experience whatsoever, 
is he even an upgrade over what Mark Richt had been? Obviously, Coach Richt had had a great deal of success. There were a lot of doubts around the Georgia program when Georgia was losing like three straight games and scuffling to an 8-5 and five season and losing to Georgia Tech, losing to Florida, you know, losing the kinds of games that mattered to Georgia fans there at the time. A lot of folks were wondering what's really happening with Georgia. And according to what one of the players on the team said, Kirby Smart during that time was saying, next year, we're going to play for a national championship. That he was confident and privately he expressed that confidence to his players, and apparently that wasn't the only time that Kirby Smart did that because Josh's friend, Jake Camarda, who you remember as a part of uh, Georgia's first national championship there in 2021, said a similar thing that Kirby Smart also expressed a similar sentiment to him before Georgia finally broke through and won a national championship here in 2021. This is also Jake Camarda from Dog Nation Daily. And I, I kid you not, I was talking to Coach Smart a very similar story to Josh before um, my senior season, before the season even had even gotten going. This is probably in January of, uh, uh, I think it was 2020, probably okay. after, after that, after my junior year. And he looks at me, he goes, we're going to win a national championship this year. Wow. I swear. That's what he told me. And I looked at him and I said, okay, wow. let's go. And I remember we went that entire year and that entire year, just it just felt different. The connection was different. And, you know, you'll hear stories about that team for forever. So Jacob Marta said Kirby Smart looked at him prior to the 2021 season, a year in which a lot of, you know, blowhards in the media were like, well, if Georgia doesn't want a national championship this year, when are they going to do it? It was sort of being treated as a sort of win now or else type of season for Kirby Smart. And Kirby Smart said, okay, bet we'll win now. Uh, we'll win one, and he said that to Jake Kamara, as Kamara told us himself. We're going to win a national championship here this season. So doesn't that kind of create some curiosity in your mind of what is Kirby Smart saying privately right now? What does Kirby Smart think privately right now? The Ohio State players are boasting and bragging. It's national championship or bust. The defense is going to be legendary. They're going to be unstoppable. This is the year they're going to break through and finally win something of note under Ryan Day. And they'll be more than happy to talk to you about that out loud. Being very, very open here right now. Georgia, when it begins spring practice this week, we already know it's not going to do those kinds of things. It's not going to say those kinds of things. Georgia's just a lot more professional about the way that it speaks. But what does the leader of the organization, Kirby Smart, think? And what will he say to his guys privately? We're led to believe that in the past, he has been more than happy to call his own shot with that team inside the organization when he thinks they're ready to sort of break through and play for a title as they did in 2017 or break through and finally win one there in 2021. The guy who knows the roster the best, the guy who knows the talent level the best in the past has known when it was ready to break through and climb to the top of the sport. What does he think about this team here this year? He may not reveal to us uh, exactly all of his thoughts about this. But on the inside, you know he knows, and I'd die to know myself what he's telling his own players as they get ready to begin spring practice here this week. My name's Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented today by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. We're glad to have you with us as you join us here today across all video platforms, 10 a.m., radio, Athens Sports Radio 960 The Ref, podcast, wherever you find them, including Posting the show at the world famous dog And until we've gotten some great feedback as of late, <laughs> we've had uh, our good friend Kaylee Manziel and Jay Black helped us out with this a little bit too. Kind of getting that show posted at a consistent time there at dognation.com, something that admittedly I was not always very good at. I've been fired from that job of uh, posting the show there at dognation.com. So uh, there you go there on that. Uh, but we've, I tell you, we've gotten a great, great, uh, uh, you know, kind of string going here. A lot of folks checking in on the show there at dognation.com or Apple Podcasts, the Spotify, using those podcast platforms, and we certainly appreciate all of that. And we really appreciate our friends at Palo Window and Door of Georgia who make all this possible for you there as well. Energy efficient windows and doors. That's what they're all about. So as we move to sort of a warm weather time of year when, you know, your air conditioning is going to be cranked up and running and that stuff is really, really expensive. You know that. Uh, you don't want that you know, energy escaping out of the house and you're paying for energy, but you're not getting the full use out of that because improperly sealed windows or doors are just sort of a, 
sort of old inferior product, you know, may not be keeping that on the inside of the house where it's supposed to be. Well, that's what you're going to prevent when you install Pella windows and doors. Your house is going to look better on the outside uh, there too, which is a great way to be a great neighbor and a great way to take care of the thing that probably matters to you more than anything else, the financial investment, the emotional connection that is your own home. And that's what Pella Window and Door of Georgia helps you do. So you've heard me talk about them for a long time. And I think it's time for you to talk to them yourself, because while I can kind of make the recommendation and describe, you know, what makes it such a uh, a terrific thing, it's, it's actually that conversation with one of the Pella experts that really sort of fills in the gaps because they are an expert. I am not. They can tell you all about why it's better you can really go to the experience center there in Duluth, put your hands on the product, feel what makes it different, and the array of options they offer there as well. So it's time for you to have that conversation. Stop by and see them there in Duluth, or they can come to you, which is always a really cool and convenient thing. You can connect with them virtually if you'd rather do that there as well. So let me give you a phone number to dial and then obviously a website to use there too. It's 678-638-1429. 1429 or online, PellaofGA.com slash DogNation. One more time, PellaofGA.com slash DogNation. Just do me two favors. First of all, remember this. Between now and the end of the month, that's March 31st, you can get 20% off your project or no money down, no interest payments for 12 months. I want you to remember that for me. Uh, big savings between now and the end of the month, 20% off your project or no money down, no interest, no payments for 12 months. Really good stuff there. The other favor I want you to do for me is when you talk to them, I want you to tell them that I said they'd take good care of you, that BA from Dog Nation Daily sent you to them, and that BA said y'all are going to take really good care of me because, I listen, after all the years of uh, sending folks their way and having uh, people in our audience come back and rave and and, and really uh, just celebrate the experience they had, I know how true all of that is. So one more time, give them a call, 678-638-1429, or find them online, PellaofGA.com slash Dog Nation. Pella window and door of Georgia is viewed to be the best. We're going to get John Stinchcomb here coming up in just a moment. I talked uh, myself about how good I think that Georgia can be for this upcoming season. But let's talk to uh, John Stinchcomb here in a couple of minutes about how good he thinks that Georgia can be. And we'll talk about some of the areas in which that that roster strength can perhaps lead to improvement so that Georgia can finish the 2024 season on a brighter note than it finished the 2023 season, at least in terms of its end-of-season goal of winning a national championship. Prior to that, though, let's go around the doghouse. And I want to talk about something that I thought was very interesting to ESPN the other day, which I would say reflects the opinion that we have shared, but perhaps is not the kind of thing that everybody else necessarily agrees with. When you look on paper, Georgia's playing the most, I would say, interesting schedule. And I think, objectively speaking, probably the most difficult schedule on paper to begin a season. Certainly the program's history that I've been following Georgia football. I can't speak to anything that happened before I was born. But in my lifetime of you know being around and being aware and following Georgia football, I don't know that I've ever seen a more interesting and on paper difficult schedule than the one that Georgia is playing here this year, which sort of begs the question, well, of all of these really interesting games, what is the one that's more interesting than any other? And I sort of agree with an assessment from ESPN's Mark Schlebaugh that I believe it's that road trip to Texas that sort of stands as the game that's going to define the Georgia season, perhaps more so than anything else. I want to read to you what Schlebaugh said about this, then I'll have – my own sort of take on this there as well. So uh, ESPN's Mark Schleyball, this is the story from DogNation.com, has tabbed the Georgia game October 19 against Texas as the game that's going to define the 2024 season. The quote from Schleyball is, with the Crimson Tide retooling after Nick Saban's retirement, Georgia fans will spend the summer dreaming about the Bulldogs' October 19th trip to Texas. Schleyball goes on to say, the Longhorns might be the most difficult opponent this season after winning a Big 12 title and reaching the college football playoff for the first time in 2023. It will also be Georgia's first trip to Austin in 66 years. How about that? That's certainly an interesting thing. But Schlebaugh says it's the October 19th game for Georgia against Texas. That's the biggest game on the 2024 uh, schedule. We agree with this, but there's a little bit of a caveat to that. You know, I think it's interesting in the same piece at um, uh, ESPN.com where the season-defining game for Georgia was Texas. It's also true that they had tabbed Georgia as the season-defining game for two teams that Georgia plays prior to playing against Texas. That's Clemson to open the season, and that's Alabama on September 28th. Now, we talked on Friday about the fact that all of a sudden, as you head towards the offseason and into the summer and knowing that Georgia's first game comes up against Clemson, all of a sudden there is a lot of chatter about Clemson and the Georgia-Clemson game in particular, that the game – is actually getting bigger in our minds than maybe I thought it probably would be. 
Some of that's because Dabo Swinney's being treated with respect because there's now one fewer coach active with a national championship now that Nick Saban is retired. So Dabo's stature has seemingly sort of grown because of that. Georgia and Clemson are going to battle it out for some top recruits. Uh, you know, just the, the overall feeling here that, you know, that, that Clemson wants to try to return to the national stage makes that Georgia-Clemson game bigger. And while it seems like the Georgia-Alabama game on paper is smaller because Nick Saban's not coaching in it, here's what I can promise you. When you get to the week of September 28th and that game's about to be played, the game is going to feel very big at that time because one, one of the things that Alabama fans are going to do is, we all do this as sports fans, they're going to talk themselves into Kalen DeBoer. They're going to talk themselves into that week being a chance to prove that Kalen DeBoer is ready for the challenge of trying to replace Nick Saban in Alabama. There will be a lot of hype around Georgia-Alabama in September when it's played. So my point is, for the Georgia-Texas game to feel as big as Mark Schleybaugh thinks it will feel, and as big as I assume it probably will feel as well, Georgia's got the responsibility of taking care of business against Clemson to open the season at Alabama on September 28th. You know, relegating Clemson to the same status that it has been since Georgia beat him in 2021 and relegating Alabama to the status of that we assume they're about to occupy sort of a second tier in the SEC now that uh, Nick Saban's no longer at Alabama. Well, in order for that to be true, Georgia's got to go out and beat him and take care of that business so that can be the case. And if that's the situation, then, yeah, Georgia-Texas looms as the kind of defining battle of, you know, what does supremacy in this league look like right now? Is it the old school SEC, which Georgia represents, or is it the 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 kind of new school SEC that welcomed in a, a program like Texas? And oh yeah, by the way, to kind of add to this, you know, much like Georgia has the Clemson game and the Alabama game uh, to sort of earn its way into the Texas game, feeling as big as it could feel. You've also got a similar thing going on there as well, where Texas has to you know, play Michigan on the road early in the year. They also have to play their rivalry game against Oklahoma. So you've got a couple of games for both sides that if Georgia can win it and Texas can win it, then not only does that October date for Georgia in Austin loom as the biggest game on the schedule for Georgia here this year, I think you can make a pretty significant case that it may be the biggest regular season game that perhaps Kirby Smart's ever played at Georgia. I mean, keep in mind, you know, go back through all the years, how many of them have ever felt bigger than this one could feel. So it's one of the reasons why we're so excited about Georgia spring practice, because the Georgia spring practice is about to take place. The position battles that are about to be waged, the new stars who are potentially about to emerge. All of that is so timely because Georgia needs all hands on deck, as many capable and contributing players as possible because of the schedule that Georgia's about to play. There are a lot of interesting and fascinating games, and perhaps none more interesting and fascinating thus far in the Kirby Smart era than going to Austin in in October with a lot of stakes and a chance to prove who really is on top of this new and expanded SEC. What a fascinating showdown that's going to be. And that is Around the Doghouse here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia here today. Now, I want to keep this conversation going, both in terms of what can happen at spring practice and what will happen when you get to the 2024 season. No better guy for us to do that with than our buddy John Stinchcomb, the former Georgia All-American. Let's welcome him in today as a part of Dog Nation Daily, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. Bring on John Stinchcomb here, and as I said before, we'll obviously get more into Georgia spring practice here coming up in a couple of moments, but I do want to keep the schedule talk going for a second, John. Uh, Mark Schleyball, ESPN, says he believes the Georgia-Texas game is the season-defining game for Georgia. I certainly agree with that, too. I think it may be the biggest game on paper that Georgia's played in the regular season with Kirby Smart as Georgia head coach. But the caveat to that is, in order for that to be true, you got to take care of business against you know Clemson. you got to take care of business against Alabama. And while Georgia's a relatively sizable favorite on paper against Clemson, it's only a, you know, a much smaller favorite when it comes to that game against Alabama. So, you know, A, how big do you think the Georgia-Texas game can be? And how important is it for Georgia to handle business in those prior games so the trip to Austin can feel every bit as big as it's supposed to be? 
Well, I think one of the old adages uh, that holds truth, no matter where you're at, is you earn the opportunity to play in big games. And for Georgia, for, for Georgia, Texas to be a big game, you have to take care of business leading up to it. So, you know, you, you progress through the season. Clemson's a big game because it's one of the first opportunities Georgia has to stake its claim towards a, a college football playoff run for that season. Now you progress through that season. Uh, and and I think we all have the same game circled. Clemson's a fun one. Uh, going to Tuscaloosa, that's going to be a big challenge. And then obviously Austin with the expansion of the SEC, all three big highlightable games. But it will only matter if you've taken care of business leading up to it. So uh, you you earn the opportunity for that to be relevant. If If Georgia isn't the team that they project to be or any of these other teams that have seen the amount of turnover, uh, that Texas and Alabama both have uh, just from their rosters and, and players getting ready for the NFL and, and the like, then it's not going to be as relevant. It's not going to be. But, you know, we're, we're sitting here in March and projecting, and I think all the teams in this discussion project really well. Texas probably, in my opinion, uh, returning the most and has the pieces in place, uh, specifically with what they've done um, – in the portal and, and with their stability and uh, recruiting and, and guys they have returning, that's going to be and should be a really big contest. Two teams that I would expect to be a part of the college football expanded playoffs in the end, uh, but a real great foresight into what we can expect come January and beyond. I also think there's a symbolic value to the Georgia Texas game that goes beyond just, hey, good team going on the road to try to beat its toughest regular season opponent. This is also the deal where, John, you know the reputation that Texas has. You know, these are people that, to be honest, you know, they have a very inflated opinion of themselves. And I think that Texas <laughs> thinks it is potentially bigger than the SEC, whereas I think a lot of the SEC people, who, to be honest with you, we also have a pretty inflated sense of ourselves as well sometimes. I think we think that Texas is about to find out how tough the SEC really is. So it's – that's the sort of backdrop and the backstory for this game of Texas thinks that it can be the biggest program and what we think of as the best league. Whereas we sort of think, ah, oh, Texas, you're about to find out what real football is all about. And so there's a certain sense in which there's SEC pride on the line for Georgia, although this is an SEC game, because I think that a lot of people around Austin think they're going to step into this league and solve it pretty quick. And clearly we don't, you know, you know, th th think that's likely to be as easy as perhaps some of them sort of assume. So to me, there's a little bit of a, of, of a backstory here and kind of a subtext that's different than just two good teams trying to fight for a playoff spot in a given year. Yes. And I think that's a very valid point. The biggest challenge of the sec is consistency. You cannot have uh, a couple of let, let down games back to back or, or you're not going to, finish the season where you want to and you know granted there's probably a little more space this year with the expanded playoff set up than what you've had in the past Le past few years if you're not undefeated then you could be on the outside looking in I think we that hits and resonates pretty close to home especially this past year so there's a slight bit of cushion there but there's also an added degree of of challenge Georgia as you, you're looking at the schedule that's a pretty hefty yes. uh, slate of games. And and Texas is no stranger uh, to, to that. They're going to face – their level of competition is going to be much more increased this year than what they've known in the past. The SEC is a real challenge. Our middling teams are far superior to the middling teams of other conferences. I think you look at the bowl series, uh, you know, just classic bowl games – and you're going to see conference twos and threes versus five, six, and sevens out of, out of the SEC. And they're competitive, if not won, by Georgia. So I think that the challenge for Texas is we know what your high end is, or think we do, that your ceiling is, is as lofty as anyone in the country. But can you consistently come out and perform – the way that Georgia has had to, the way Alabama has had to, the way the other SE teams are expected to, uh, to still be relevant at the end of the year. So 
for Texas, it's it's a a new challenge. Not only are we going to a new conference, or can we do this at a really high level, but can we do it at a high level week in and week out? No, I think that's really well said. I want to move on to spring practice here for a moment. I sort of joked about this before you joined us. I don't know what's going to happen for spring practice. I obviously can't predict with accuracy what's going to happen for Georgia this year. But one thing I'm pretty certain of is you won't hear any Georgia players talking the way that some Ohio State players have talked about being legendary and unstoppable and national title or bust. I mean, I would say there's justifiable reason for competence at UGA, but the players around Georgia just don't quite speak that way. So, John, is it fair to say that that Georgia will go about its business this spring in a little bit of a quieter fashion than what it seems like is happening at Ohio State here right now? We may have lost John. Uh, I think, yeah, I lost you for a second sorry there. About that. But, did you get the uh, quest? Did you hear the question, uh, John? I got the gist. I know we're no Ohio State. We may be uh, working on a little bit of a signal thing with John. Why don't we do this? Let's let, let's see if we can exit the conversation with John, and let's see if we can get him back on there because I think he's got a lot of interesting things to say about this. And as I said before, I, I also want to kind of get a little bit more deeply into some of the things that uh, were actually going to happen with Georgia spring practice here and the way in which some of the new transfer players sort of mix in with some of the players who've been here, you know, veterans kind of coming back for one more shot at it, perhaps maybe even most interesting this time of year, some of those young players who get ready to sort of step forward. And I think we have John Stinch going back here. So, John, before we get into some of that, you know, how about the idea that uh, there's a lot of boasting coming out of Columbus and that's not the sort of thing we hear here in Athens. Oh yeah, no. Nobody likes Ohio State. That's a national sentiment. You're you're either a Buckeye or you're not, and I think uh, most of us can agree that they're the worst. So, with Ohio State and their approach of legacy, I think that's a a bold, arrogant approach that has proven to be the downfall of many successful programs in the past. I think you look at the approach that Georgia has had, and it's the right one each season especially in college football, is a brand new opportunity, a new team. I mean, there are some returning faces, but I wouldn't be as thrilled to take the field uh, if I had a team that once had Marvin Harrison Jr. and no longer has that player. So I think Georgia knows that um, each time you, you get you start a new season, there are some returning pieces that you should feel really good about. But finding that right chemistry um, – has its own challenges. I think your identity as a program is important. I think your approach is important. But to think that, hey, you're building a legacy, those kind of words are earned. They're not projected, and uh, especially from the inside out. If other people say that about you, okay, fine. But I think the mentality of we've made it and, you know, this is who we are, uh, I think that has to be earned. And Georgia's approach year in and year out is, golly, we've got, you know, we just lost 17 players to the NFL draft, and we're going to have to find ways to replace them. And we need young guys to step up. And week four in the season, we're still talking about development, and we're not where we need to be. That is a totally different approach than, you know, hey, y'all just need to sit back and watch because this is a, a, a legacy that we're going to leave, and we're this is a legendary situation. I will say they've got a lot of pieces. They've spent a lot of money on them. They've brought in a, a number of players, and they are a competitor. But just their general approach is uh, it's puke worthy. Nobody likes it. Yeah, no doubt about that. I want to talk about a couple of issues in particular for Georgia. You know. I've said over and over, I think the one big thing for Georgia this year is you need a little bit better performance in the defensive line than you probably got a year ago. And I was looking at some of the stuff on paper, and, you know, John, you know, knowing that's an issue as a, for instance, Georgia, I think was like, what, 20 or whatever in, in the country in terms of rushing yards per attempt. That's sort of outside the 90th the percentile. That is not a place you expect to see Georgia. And so you clearly need improvement there. But gosh, John, I like these names. I love Stackhouse and Brinson coming back. You know, when you add McLeod from South Carolina, that's at least an SEC body. We'll see what he brings to the table. You know, Jordan Hall stepping forward. You know, a guy like Gabe Harris and Tyron Ingham Dawkins kind of in a defensive end competition uh, now that it uh, looks like Mikhail Williams is going to play some outside linebacker for you. Um, you think about, you know, maybe Jamal Jarrett gets a chance to sort of step forward here and, and, and step up. 
this is to me is a very interesting crop of defensive linemen knowing that it's a huge need it's a place you need improvement but gosh it's a long list of names to help contribute to that justin uh, 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 you know uh, miller maybe you know uh, i should say christian miller excuse me maybe the, the the best example of a guy who could have a really big sort of breakout season the point here is boy you got you need improvement for your defensive line but you got a long list of names to potentially help contribute to that Yes, and this past year, I think we recognized we didn't have that marquee, real game changer that we've had in the past. There was no Jalen Carter on the roster. There wasn't a Jordan Davis. Uh, there might be, but I think the players that could become that level were young and needed a year or two to develop. And we've got we had solid play, but the expectation and when you play at a high level is that you have superior play. And at times it just wasn't present, especially in, in, in some of those bigger matchups. I think you watch the game against Alabama and say, what was one of the key areas that we weren't able to win individual matchups. And it was along, along our defensive line. Uh, we've got good players. We had good players last year. I think now with the, the younger players that you just listed, the Halls and the Jarrett's and the Millers, uh, I look forward to see the difference, that sophomore jump that you can expect from the bigger bodies. That's a huge transition going from high school competition into SEC level play. They were able to contribute in, in minor doses, but now that it's another year in this offseason program, another year to see – that film and know what the expectation is, I expect those guys, the younger players, to come in and, and set a new tone. I, I, I'm like you. I'm appreciative. I thought Warren Brinson was one of our most in, uh, effective interior pass rushers. Uh, and, and Stackhouse had his moments holding up at the point. But in, in that Alabama game specifically, I think the level of play – wasn't quite where we needed it to be. And now we've got an opportunity for these younger guys to kind of step into those roles and see, are, are we moving from that good to great space or uh, are, are we still trying to supplement based on scheme and added bodies? I think it makes a big difference when you can provide pressure, you can hold up up front and it allows your defensive coordinators to do some special things when you've got your front three or four guys maintaining the point of the uh, of attack and winning those battles. You used an interesting phrase a moment ago. You said marquee game changer. And I really think if that's going – if there's going to be one of those guys in the roster for Georgia here this year, I think it needs to come from sort of the edge rush outside linebacker position. Now, listen, Malachi Stark is already one of the best players in the country, so he's – kind of at that level, but you need somebody else to sort of join him in that group. And I believe the best candidates for that I think probably exist at sort of the outside linebacker spot, kind of a new look for Mikael Williams getting a chance to play stand-up, you know, more frequently after uh, playing a lot of defensive end. You know, Damon Wilson's a guy that if if the, the, the hype that was connected around him as a recruit, if all that's real, then in sort of year two is where a lot of that sort of starts to – to come to the forefront here a little bit. John, I think that Georgia needs a, a kind of a superstar level player on defense. We've been used to it being defensive linemen. We've seen it be the inside linebacker before. I think somebody becoming that kind of player on the outside edge, I just think that would be, A, it would be a huge luxury for Georgia, but it might even be an imperative. Georgia might really need that in order to be everything that it can be defensively. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's the one space that that Georgia really hasn't uh, had a had a, a presence that scares other teams. I think at times, especially late in the season, Jalen Walker emerged as one of our best pass rushers, and he's a guy that I think Georgia is just trying to figure out ways to get him on the field. He's so athletic; he can play inside, he can play outside, and and has proven to be an effective pass rusher. But we have had not had that one player that uh, offensive lines and tackles and coordinators are going, ooh, we need to, in past situations, we've got to account for this player. I don't think they're scheming around any individual. Unlike a Dallas Turner that you're saying, hey, we've got to have a plan coming into this game for. So is it is it Wilson? Great. I, I, I like the 
you know, again, the younger players that have the athleticism and you see them on paper and they come out of high school and you go, man, he passes the eye test and can certainly impress you at the talent combine. But can they transition that into performance on a Saturday? I think that's what's exciting. I think you certainly have uh, some athletic guys. I think we may have lost. Is what can that look? What can that look like for this Georgia defense with some of these younger guys? Can they be that X factor that um, other teams are having to account for? John, it's certainly a fascinating conversation. I appreciate you being a part of that with us here today on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. Can't wait to watch spring practice unfold, and can't wait to talk about it with you every step of the way as we get ready for G Day coming up on April thirteenth. Should be a great time. Uh, John, thanks for your time here today, and we'll look forward to talking to you soon on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Palo Window and Door of Georgia. Well, I appreciate it, B.A. You know, this is an important time of year for Georgia, you know, a, a team that the expectations are through the roof, and as many young players, you know, first and second year guys that they will be turning to, uh, it makes for a very competitive time of year. So for a March and, and our first part of April that could otherwise be boring, uh, there should be a lot of energy and excitement as to the impact this time of year can have on on the upcoming season. So exciting times, B.A. Glad to be a part of them and go dogs. I, I love the conversation, John. We'll look forward to talking to you soon. Sure, Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. Yeah, I think that's all really well said, and I'm guessing we'll probably do more of this on the show at some point in time this week. But, you know, I mentioned Mikhail Williams, where I think he can be. You know, Damon Wilson, I think he can be, and, and John's, you know, right. You know, Jalen Walker's also, you know, emerging there too. That it kind of goes back to what I say. It's like there are some legitimate questions. You know, you know, can Georgia have the sort of superstar pass rush that what seems like it sort of stops short of having? You know, can you get better along your defensive line? These are all really important questions. When you look at the the magnitude, the multitude of names that potentially provide answers for those questions. I think it sets up for a really, really fun and very interesting spring. And the great part about that is, is we'll bite our time with spring practice. We'll get ready for G on April 13th. And when that's over with, we're ready to go cruising on the Caribbean on board the Lure of the Seas, which takes us to cruise around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean here right now, our Dog Nation cruise. And we're like just right here at the doorstep of all of that. And I just cannot wait to showcase a Lure of the Seas to everyone who's on board that ship with us coming up this April. We've been so excited. From the very moment I heard that our Dog Nation cruise this year was going to take place on an Oasis-class ship, I've just been thrilled about the chance to sort of showcase it. And look at this. Look at the just the just the, the majesty of this vessel. It's just gorgeous. Uh, an unbelievable experience on board Allure of the Seas for every person lucky enough to be there. So when you hear us talking about, you know, like the Aqua Theater on the back of the ship and the high diving show that takes place there, you know, you've got the ice skating shows that take place, the Broadway style entertainment, the the various bars and lounges that all kind of have live music. You can just sort of hop from venue to venue there at night after you have a delicious dinner, just sort of go from location to location and just enjoy all of the entertainment options of the ship. And for me, really, that's the thing that probably separates Royal Caribbean from anybody else that sort of plays in the space is Royal Caribbean's ability to kind of keep you entertained while you're on board. I don't know that any uh, cruise line puts more of an investment into really top-notch quality entertainment than what Royal Caribbean does. So we love that. It's one of the things that we can't wait to show with all of our Dog Nation people. And we would really tell you, as you listen to the excitement that we have about being on board Allure of the Seas coming up in just a few weeks now, you know, that's a reminder to you that there's a lot of new fun things happening for Royal Caribbean. We've already debuted Icon of the Seas here this year. Utopia of the Seas is going to debut in July. You've got Hideaway Beach, a brand new adults only enclave as a part of Perfect Day Coco Cay there as well. So there's all kinds of fun new things for Royal Caribbean here in 2024. And right now is your time to enjoy those things. So Royal Caribbean wants you to contact a great travel agent to help you make your travel plans. Jessica Slater is ours and we want her to be yours as well. Give her a call 770-718-9147. That's 770-718-9147. Email her, jslater at dreamvacations.com, and she can talk to you about all the great things that Royal Caribbean has coming up for you this year. And by the way, we'll see you on Allure of the Seas coming up in April for our Dog Nation cruise there as well. So a couple of stories to get to here today. First of all, you got Drew Pine. This is a quarterback who has been around the world of college football. Was at Notre Dame for three years, I think uh, starting in 2020, was there for three years, 
Most recently, he was at Arizona State, and now he is transferring to Missouri. So let me tell you why I find this to be interesting. Because a year ago, if a guy like Pine was coming to Missouri, I think one of the things that we would have said is, oh, this is a reflection of kind of an open quarterback situation there and a chance to, you know, maybe step up and kind of, you know, emerge in that job. Remember last year it was Jay Garcia, the former Miami quarterback who had showed up there. And we thought that Garcia, along with Sam Horn, who we obviously know from his time at Collins Hill High School, those would all be guys who would have pushed, you know, Brady Cook to potentially be the starting quarterback because you could go back to 2022. A lot of Missouri fans, even in the game, by the way, that Missouri played Georgia much closer than people thought, you know, a lot of Missouri fans just weren't too happy with Brady Cook and kind of wanted an upgrade there at the quarterback spot. Well, this is an example of just how wrong sometimes those things can kind of turn out to be. Because last year, Brady Cook really emerged as the guy for Missouri at quarterback and, you know, one of the better seasons the Missouri's ever had as a program. And so now you come to 2024, a guy like Drew Pine transfers to Missouri, you know, track record of being a couple different Power 5 spots, Obviously, you know, former relatively high-profile guy at Notre Dame. But there's no question that Pine is coming to Missouri right now to be the backup. And I guess these, you know, in this day and age, you can sort of stay in college forever if you want to, that maybe he has a chance to compete to be the starter there in 2025. But nobody doubts Brady Cook right now as the starter at Missouri. And I would tell you, you know, I think on this show, we've been probably guilty this offseason thus far. We've talked about the various teams around the SEC. We probably have not talked about Missouri enough that that Cook right now among the shorter list of guys that can win the Heisman Trophy, which seems like a, a bold statement, but look at the odds. You know, he's on that kind of first page of the Heisman odds. You look at, um, we, we talked the other day about the on three NIL valuation. Brady Cook's a little higher on that list, and you probably realize there as well. This is a Missouri team that only lost twice a year ago. Had there been a 12-team playoff last season, Missouri would have probably been in it. They believe they can be in that again. And Brady Cook is sort of the unquestioned guy at Missouri right now. So when a guy like Pine transfers in, it's a totally different feeling than it would have been a year ago. Last year, open competition, who knows who emerges. This year, you're sort of playing for next year because nobody doubts that Brady Cook is the guy there in Como right now. We've talked to you a lot in recent days about proposed changes to the college football playoff. And no, I'm not talking about the 12-team playoff. That's going to happen, but it hasn't happened yet. And yet, even though we're sort of waiting for the 12-team playoff to sort of emerge this year, there's already talk of what's going to happen on the other side of that and this sort of 12-team playoff that we're growing to understand how it's going to impact us for this year and next year, 2025. By the time we get to 2026, there's already some talk that, well, maybe by then you've expanded to a 14-team playoff. And there was some chatter a few days ago that was almost universally just uh, harshly rejected which was the idea that the SEC and the Big Ten champs would get, you know, sort of buys and, you know, sort of earn special status to be advanced in the playoff in a way that the Big 12, the ACC, and the way they would not be treated. You might, you know, obviously every fan rejected this, but, you know, people involved in, like, say, the Big 12 and the ACC, they're also harshly rejecting this too, including uh, I saw a really good line from Sonny Dykes, the TCU coach, where he said something effect of, this would be like the Dallas Cowboys getting a buy in the playoff because they've got more fans than the Cincinnati Bengals do or something along those lines, which I think is kind of a funny way of saying that and probably a pretty good synopsis of the way that almost anyone who's not the SEC or the Big Ten feel about this. And a lot of folks sort of have said, well, all of this is just a strategy that the SEC and the Big Ten are kind of floating this as a possibility so that they can later on say, well, okay, well, we – you know, we tried, and so therefore now we're going to go over and just sort of do our own thing now. Some people have wondered about that. But the other thing that people kind of wonder about as it relates to all of this is, well, how come the Big Ten gets treated the same way the SEC does? You know, the SEC has a history of winning the playoff and advancing the playoff, and other than Michigan here this year, that's not really something the Big Ten has a long history of doing. That's totally true, but this is where I think you got to confront reality here for a moment, which is, the Big Ten, I think, has handled its business here in a pretty smart way. And I don't love everything they've done, but in terms of their maneuverings, you can't say they're not smart. The SEC is the best league on the field. Everybody knows that. What the Big Ten has tried to be is the sort of best league in the boardroom. They've tried to make some maneuverings to position themselves strong from a business standpoint as a way of mitigating the lack of success they've had in the football field. And it's hard to deny that hasn't worked, I guess, to use a double negative. The point is it seems like what they've tried is working pretty well. 
we don't like these big behemoth national leagues. We think they're sort of, you know, not really keeping with the spirit of college football, but it has given the Big Ten a chance to say they play at the same level as the SEC, even though the SEC has a much better history of winning. The Big Ten says we may not be better than the SEC, but we can be bigger. And by being bigger, that's going to give us a seat at the table that we otherwise would not be able to earn our way up to on the field. And I said before, you can't really say that isn't working. It seems like you know they're having some success with that. And so when you kind of wonder, well, why is it that the Big Ten is being treated similar to the SEC when on the field these two leagues could not be more dissimilar in terms of their track record of success and their sort of year-to-year results? I think the reason why is because – They've made some pretty shrewd moves in terms of their TV contract, the media partners they've acquired, the expansion as sort of greedy and gross as sometimes it looks to be, has certainly made the Big Ten into a more formidable presence in college football overall. And so I think the SEC has been kind of, you know, forced into a position of treating them like an equal, even though in the football field, these two teams could not, two leagues could not be any less equal. You know, based on the way in which the uh, the Big Ten has operated from a business standpoint here, they've given themselves some credibility they would never be able to earn for themselves on the field. Speaking of the Big Ten, one more note here. I think it's interesting, you know, Sharon Moore, the brand-new coach at Michigan, just how new of a look his coaching staff is going to have. Mike Hart here, the uh, former Michigan running back who has been running back's coach, appears that he is going to be out there in uh, in Ann Arbor, which I believe means – that there's only going to be one remaining holdover from the previous Jim Harbaugh staff on the new staff for, for Sharon Moore. Now, this obviously, I think, puts you know Moore into a pretty tough spot in terms of trying to maintain some recruiting success that Jim Harbaugh had kind of been enjoying. You know, Michigan, uh, you had the big noise when Harbaugh first got hired. Remember the satellite camps and all the stuff there about what Michigan was going to do, kind of become a presence down in the South and – For the most part, that all kind of fizzled away pretty quick. And then I would say that for a good number of years, Michigan was almost a non-factor and a non-entity completely in the overall recruiting conversation. Well, in the years prior to winning a national championship, they sort of kind of reemerged there, and uh, Harbaugh was a little bit more of a factor in recruiting. Obviously, if you want to keep pace with what Ohio State is wanting to do right now, a program like Michigan has got to have its best foot forward in recruiting, and they're going to try to do that with a brand-new staff. It will be interesting to see how much that works. But the other thing is, is when a guy like Harbaugh leaves and the entire staff is completely different, I just think it kind of speaks to whether it be sort of a quiet dissatisfaction that some of the Michigan sort of administration perhaps had with Harbaugh or, you know, perhaps this just sort of disjointed nature of everything that was going on in Ann Arbor this past year. It's obvious that Harbaugh wanted to go other play, go to the NFL, and it sort of seems like, Everything about the situation there in Ann Arbor for this national championship season was a little bit of a short-term proposition. Very, very strange to see so much turnover, so much changeover uh, as you promote an offensive coordinator to head coach, but everybody else in the staff, a completely new and different look. And I would say maintaining the success that Jim Harbaugh had earned, I think for Michigan may prove to be difficult to do. We'll make that cruising around the SEC courtesy of Royal Caribbean. And before we wrap up here today, Let me give a shout-out to the Diamond Dogs, who got another weekend sweep. They're off to, like, you know, basically the hottest start in program history for all intents and purposes, now getting ready to roll into SEC play there as well. We've talked about Charlie Condon a lot as of late and the incredible performance he's, uh, you know, provided with the bat in his hand here thus far. And, you know, this is not an ad because – but it is just kind of an encouragement that – if you've never tried college baseball, this might be a really good time to do that. If you've never really paid attention what this sport can be, I think that you'd really, really enjoy it. It seems like Wes Johnson's bringing new energy as the uh, first-year coach. Uh, obviously, stepping into SEC play is going to be much more difficult. We're not in any way disputing that, that that some of the success that Georgia's enjoyed has almost certainly been in part because of the schedule that it's played, but this is still probably – a team playing with a little bit different level of energy than perhaps it has the last couple of years. So congratulations to another fun weekend for the Diamond Dogs. They've been red hot and a really, really intriguing start to SEC play coming up for them. And if you enjoy these weekend series, get dialed in for them. And if, you, if you've if you never done that before, go see them at Foley Field. You know, tune in and watch them. A lot of times it's the SEC Network Plus, which is pretty easy to access. Uh, if you've got a cable provider or something like that, a uh, really, really good time around college baseball. So enjoy the Diamond Dogs as they get ready to begin SEC play. 
So for our golden shoe today, the other day, Georgia Football on its official Twitter account, its X account, uh, did something kind of fun. They had one of those gifts where it's like the various, you know, potential covers involving Georgia football for the EA Sports College football video game. And they're kind of flashing and you click it and you get it to stop. And whatever it stops on is your supposed cover. So I, I guess this is pretty good symmetry. I played along and I got it to stop. And look what it stopped on. Georgia's celebrating a win in Jacksonville against the lousy stinking Gators. I would say that's probably pretty appropriate. So uh, I would say that all works out very, very well. A lot of symmetry between what we normally do here. So I thought this was fun from Georgia with some potential covers for the EA Sports College Football video game. And I thought my own potential cover on this, well, it couldn't have worked out uh, much better at all. So we'll give Golden Shoes there to the official account for that. And by the way, speaking of the lousy stinking Gators, Georgia's been celebrating a lot of those victories in Jacksonville in recent years. In fact, it's been 1,220 days since Ford has beaten Georgia. That is our Gator Hater Updater. We love celebrating Georgia's dominance over its number one rival. And we'll see you back here tomorrow at Dog Nation Daily, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. And on video, time now for the RS Andrew School Dinner. I think I've told you this before. I love our friends at Pella Window and Door of Georgia, our great sponsor. I also have a little bit of a challenge because I grew up in like rural northeast Georgia, Hall County. It's more of an Atlanta suburb now than it probably used to be. But when I grew up there, it's the country. Like I think of myself as being from the country. And so for some reason, Pella Window, my country sort of accent wants to come out in a big way. I was, I'm always like on the verge of saying like Pella Window, Pella Window, uh, Pella Windows in Doors of Georgia. Um so glad to have him a part of the program and glad to have R.S. Andrews as a part of the R.S. Andrews cooldown. So let's get your comments and see what everybody's mind today. I'm here at dognation.com, so we'll see what they're doing here. Uh, we'll talk about Vanderbilt here right now, so that's kind of fun and interesting stuff. They were also talking a little earlier about the dust-up that happened between LSU and South Carolina in women's basketball, sort of a strange thing to see. Um and then it would, I was talking before about Angel Reese not really involving herself in that, which, listen, I'm not much of a fighter either. Uh, but I thought that was a little bit of an odd scene. Uh, let us see what's going on over here at YouTube here for a moment. Spencer Clark says, Caitlin Clark is amazing to watch. Yeah, my guess is, just given the star power that exists in women's basketball right now, we saw record ratings for the tournament last year. I'm guessing we'll see some of that again here this year. Um uh, UGA boy for life brunetti. Thank you for the kind words. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, G Gray says that women's basketball is great. Tune in. There's no doubt. There's a lot of energy around that right now. And I think what a lot of people kind of wonder is, okay, well, when Angel Reese and 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 Caitlin Clark, when these ladies go into the WNBA, are they going to bring that popularity to the WNBA? And perhaps they will. I mean, clearly they'll give you know some new star power to that league. But I do kind of find it to be fascinating how much more popular, at least that I can tell, college basketball is than the WNBA, which I think sort of speaks to just the sort of the strength of college athletics overall. There's something about um, college athletics that makes basketball stars like this at the college level bigger than they would be or will be when they move on to the WNBA level. People just really like college athletics. And while it's mostly true for college football, it is sort of, Somewhat true for college athletics in all its forms. Um, Frank Patterson wondering about Samuel Mpemba. Yeah, that's another name to sort of mention in that conversation. Indeed, that's true. Um, Skylar Thomas says the women's basketball game is more entertaining than the men's game here this year. There's certainly more star power there. Um, and, you know, I can't necessarily speak to exactly why that is. Um, I think some of that may be related to Caitlin Clark is just so good. And then when LSU beat them a year ago, I mean, maybe Angel Reese was already well super famous before that, but I think Angel Reese got really famous because she obviously taunted Caitlin Clark after that game, and so as Clark's star has risen, anybody who beats Caitlin Clark, her star rises too. That's probably a crude explanation, but that's sort of the best explanation I can have for just how come it seems like there's so much star power on the women's side in a way that there's not really on the men's side. Uh, Jonathan Aaron accusing me of potentially uh, <laughs> jinxing the baseball team. Listen, it's going to get much tougher in SEC play, so uh, we're not we're, we're not trying to get out in front of, of you know too far when it comes to the baseball team, but they are fun to watch here right now. Um, Spencer Clark says I'm corny. I watched the Oscars. 
I used to watch the Oscars all the time. Like there, there are a lot of things about me that are so different from what I used to be. Like 90s, now 90s was probably a better era for movies anyway, but like 90s into the early 2000s, man, I'm watching the Oscars every year. I would have seen most of the movies that were nominated this year. Not only have I probably not seen movies that are nominated, I'm not even sure I even know which movies were nominated. Uh, like, I, I know less. I mean, I, I feel like the state of movies is decrepit, just absolutely decrepit. And I say this as someone who loves movies. But I just feel like, I mean, listen, and my ju my sole judging on this is, is getting out the remote, going to the various streamers, and looking for something to watch. And I can't find anything. Nine times out of ten. Um, I just feel like the state of movies is just really, really bad. Um, and, I mean, like, I'm not, like, boycotting the Oscars. Like, it's just such a non-entity in my life right now. Just amazing, amazing how different. Now, that's also because, you know, I'm a dad now. I got kids. I'm busy. I'm running around doing a thousand things. Like, you know, I, I th I, this is one of the things like, when I was younger I didn't quite appreciate is the fact that, you just got so much free time when you're sort of pre-kids that you just don't really have in sort of a post-kid world. And so there's a lot of stuff that just sort of disappears. You have to really prioritize what matters to you. And, you know, Academy Awards and movies and things, award shows was sort of, for me, the first thing to go. Um, Curtis Williams says, what was the last good movie? I feel like I've seen a good movie. Um uh, yeah, what was the last good movie I saw? Let me think about that. Because honestly, my uh, uh, my memory is not even all, all that great all the time. Um, G. Gray says, we haven't had good movies consistently since 2019, 2020. Yeah, I sort of feel like, like I mean, first of all, when the pandemic happened, that kind of changed movies forever. We know that, right? And I think you're still feeling some effects of that. Um. I also think, like, if you go back to, like, 20 years ago when I felt like there were a lot of movies that I really liked, you know, I feel like the one thing that that we did then that we don't do now is the sort of mid-budget movie. You know, it seems like now there's, like, a, there's a certain, like, money ball, saber metrics thing to the sort of movie game where it's, like, they either want to spend nothing on a movie and – hope that it pops or they have a huge budget because they know it's likely to succeed in the sort of riskier kind of mid size budget movies that don't take place anymore. They don't make those movies anymore. But if you go back and look like 20 or so years ago, the movies that we all, I would say, you know, a lot of us really loved were sort of those movies that were, you know, a little bit weird, a little bit risky, you know, um, you know, some money being invested in it in the hopes that you get it back. And, those kinds of risks, the the you know the studios just don't seem to take those kind of risks anymore. Um, let's see what else. Um, Jermaine King says, "I said the Oscars are bad, but Connor and Kaylee just had their Dog Nation Oscar episode. So Jermaine, we gave them a golden shoe for that on Friday because I think that's a really cool angle and a lot of fun. And like I said, when I was when I was Kaylee's age, when I was Connor's age, I was watching the Oscars all the time." I was big into stuff like that back then. I'm just not into it anymore. Uh, but I loved their um, – I, I, I thought that was a really fun premise for a show. I was very thankful to be able to vote on that. And um, I thought it was a really good way to talk Georgia football, so that was good. Um, let's see what else. Um, I – Greg Hendrick says that Caitlin Clark is good, but I don't think you can give her the all-time score in NCAA history over Pistol Pete because when he played, there was three point shots. That's how Clark scored most of her points. I do agree with this. It um, it also reminds me of the argument that took place before we were born about Roger Maris and Babe Ruth. Kind of reminds me of that a little bit. I also, and I don't know, I don't know what this makes me. Maybe this makes me behind the times, whatever else. I think that there are men's records and there are women's records. And, you know, I, I would never think of, it's like, um, was it Gina Oriema or whoever, or, you know, Caitlin Clark now, like to me, there are records for the men's game and there are records for the women's game. 
And I don't like the intermingling of those records. I just don't. And I, like I said, I don't know what that makes me. I'm not trying to, uh, but that's just sort of the way that I feel. So in addition to the fact that Maravich played at a time in which there were no three-point shots and he did it in fewer games, uh, I think Caitlin Clark is amazing, but, you know, you know, calling her the most prolific score in the history of her version of the sport, I think ought to be enough before you start, you know, making the comparison to Pistol Pete or something like that. And by the way, you know, I think that in general, Pistol Pete is an example of when I was a kid in the 80s, I was a child in the 80s, there was a lot of like Pistol Pete stuff that was sort of in the culture. Like our basketball team, when I got to high school, we did Maravich drills. Some of y'all did the Maravich drills. Uh, we used to do Maravich drills. I feel like we've kind of lost Pistol Pete from the culture. Like, he's just been forgotten. And, you know, I'm too young to have ever seen Pete Maravich play. But as a kid in the 80s, high school kid in the 90s, Pistol Pete was sort of still around. Like, he, like his persona still existed. I feel like we've sort of forgotten Pistol Pete. Probably probably be kind of nice to sort of bring him back a little bit. Um Jonathan Aaron says, I know you're busy all the time. Must be uh, hard planning on those cruises you go on. Yeah, maybe that's why I'm not watching enough movies. I'm going on too many cruises. Uh, Jermaine King says, we need more sports movies. I, I feel like that's an example of, it doesn't seem like we have a lot of sports movies anymore. I'd agree with that. I would agree with that. Um, seems like we've kind of lost that. Uh, I, I, would, I, would, I would kind of agree with that. I miss the old days of that. And, I mean, what's amazing to me is, is like, the movies that I loved as a kid, introducing them to my kids, they loved them too. And it's just it's just kind of cool how things just sort of hold up. And, I, like, I'll tell you what I think is fascinating. So I'm a Star Wars fan. And, um, like, but when I say Star Wars fan, like, like I'm not, like, I don't know Star Wars way that some people do. I just like the movies, right? I just enjoy enjoy Star Wars. Uh, you know, take my kids to Hollywood Studios, ride the Star Wars rides, things like that. We like I'm a Star Wars fan, but I am not like an expert in like Star Wars lore. So you know, make sure you understand that. Um, but the point is, is that you introduce all these movies to your kids. It's amazing. The movies that both my kids I have an eight year old daughter and a twelve year old son. The movies they like the best out of all of them are episode four, episode five, and episode six, the ones that took place when I was a kid. And I am not pushed those movies on them or anything, but you give them a choice of watching, you know, prequels, original trilogy, trilogy, new trilogy, you know, the one-off movies. They want to watch episode four, episode five, and episode six. There's something really interesting about that, that even after all these years, you know, those are the movies that sort of hold up. And, you know, sports movies. I introduced my kids to Field of Dreams. Loved it. Loved it. Loved it. Uh, there's just something about some of those movies. Karate Kid. Loved it. It's just amazing how some of those movies just sort of really kind of hold up. Um, uh, Jonathan Aaron says, what are the most underrated sports movies? Um, we are talking about this on Friday. Y'all ever see, uh, this is, it's not like a feel-good sports movie, but we are talking about um, the... 1919 Chicago Blackhawks, Black that's a hockey team, the Black Sox. Uh, eight men out, if you've never seen that, that's an underrated sports movie. I think that's really good. Um, Frank Patterson says that uh, those movies have the Ewoks in them, so there you go. Yeah, I mean, listen, uh, I know that, that a lot of, like, hardcore Star Wars people don't like the Ewoks, but I remember, like, when when the Ewoks came out, Return of the Jedi, I mean, people in the theater were going crazy. They're just going crazy. Um, like, the two times... That I remember being in a movie. Th- now this makes it sound like we're all, you know, dorks. I guess we probably were. The two times in a movie theater, I saw people stand and cheer, or when Rocky was fighting Drago and Rocky for him, people were standing up in the movie theater cheering as if it was Georgia football. It's amazing, and I don't want to say standing, but there was loud cheering when uh, the Ewoks fought back against the stormtroopers. Uh, that got a huge reaction. Uh, pop. I got a huge pop in the movie theater. Uh, there you go. Uh, Frank Patterson said, do our kids like Lord of the Rings? So I, I feel like I need to go back and rewatch Lord of the Rings. Like I watched the trilogy when it came out. Grand, you know, display. I didn't really understand it. Um, I feel like I could go back and watch that again. I tell you what my daughter's gotten into lately are these Harry Potters. 
She likes those. Um, I tell you, the Russell says the only time I've seen anyone cheer in the theater was Tron Legacy and The Dark Knight. Okay, there you go, there you go. But like in Rocky Four, which I know I'm dating myself, but I, I was a big part of my childhood. People were like cheering the entire fight, like just like it was crazy. <laughs> um, it was crazy. Uh, Lance D mentioning Rogue One. That's of all the sort of post original trilogy movies. Uh, I would say that Rogue One is by far the best. I, I would say it's by far the best. Now, some of the, you know, like Mandalorian TV is pretty good. Um, Spencer Clark says, I like Dune and Indiana Jones. Uh, I heard this new Dune movie is supposed to be really good. I heard that's supposed to be really good. Although I don't know the first thing about it. Um, let me uh, go to Facebook for a moment. Let's see how folks are doing over there. Somebody asked a minute ago about like movie that I've seen recently that I liked. I can't even remember. Um, uh, Matt Rukavina says, I remember people cheering when Will Smith punched the alien and said, welcome to Earth and Independence Day. I could see that being true. That was also around the time that like I first went to, you know, like when I was a kid, like I told you, I grew up in the country. Like our movie theaters were not much nicer than like what a TV would be now. In fact, they're probably less nice. Like, you know, these are just sort of like, you know, sort of low quality, small, you know, around the time like Independence Day came out, that's when I first got acquainted with like the stadium seating movie theaters, the big screen, the loud sound. Um, that was sort of a, a fun era of like summer movies when you're really seeing with like the, the really big movie theaters. Really enjoyed that. Um, Joseph Kennedy, Philip Jordan Wells, talking about Ralph Macchio. Uh, original Karate Kid holds up very well. Very well. Brandon Griffin, Moneyball. I do like Moneyball. I do like that a lot. Um, I like. It's like the whole, uh, I like the way it's written, like the whole feel of that, kind of nice little soundtrack. I like all of that. Um, let's see what else. Uh, Matt Rukavina says that when it comes to Lord of the Rings, got to read the books first. Yeah, there's no doubt that's probably the case. And I also think that I just wasn't paying close enough attention. Um, <laughs> I'm not always the smartest guy in the world. Uh, I feel like if I went back and rewatched them, uh, and I, I kind of want to do that. Uh, I, I, like, I've sort of read more about J.R.R. Tolkien recently. He seems like a pretty interesting guy. I want to come go back and do more of that. Uh, Jacob O'Neill said, I forgot about the Facebook folks. I knew I'd get in trouble for that. Um, <laughs> Philip Wells on Facebook says, there must have been some good stuff in the streets for people to be cheering the Ewoks. I know not everybody likes the Ewoks, and I know the reference you're trying to make here on this, but don't. Philip, don't try to take something wholesome and turn it into something bad. Um, uh, uh, the Ewoks were fun when they first came out. Um, Brandon Griffin says The Natural. I do love The Natural song. That dun 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 dun, dun. I do like that a lot. I do like that a lot. Um, let's see what else. Jonathan Moore mentions Cool Runnings. Uh, Matt Rufino also likes Rogue One there as well, so there you go. Um, let's see what else. Joseph Kennedy wants Mike Tyson to bite Jake Paul's ear. So there you go. Philip Jordan Wells wants to bring back the parody movies, hot shot, scary movie. So I heard this speaking of parodies, Philip, I heard, you probably know more about this than I do. I heard that Liam Neeson is reprising Leslie Nielsen's role in the naked gun. Um, first of all, the original naked gun, very funny movie, very funny movie. Am I right about this? Some of y'all know more about pop culture than I do. That Liam Neeson is going to be the Leslie Nielsen character. They're remaking The Naked Gun. That could probably be pretty funny. Um, uh, let's see what else. Matt Rukavina says that any given Sunday is the best football movie ever. So I, I here's what I think is fascinating. I think there are a ton of great baseball movies. I think there are a ton of really good boxing movies. I think there are some good basketball movies. For whatever reason, I don't think football, even though you would say, well, football is our favorite sport, most of us would say that. 
for whatever reason, I don't think that football is as good a fodder for movies. Like my like my nitpick on football movies is I think the football movies have a tendency to be kind of fake because when they go to like the football scenes, it doesn't look like real football. It's like it's like you know there's a hit and some guy goes you know uh, flipping head over heels. Um, I feel like there are a lot of sort of unrealistic football movies. I think. Um, uh, Gerald Harmon says Friday Night Lights was the best football movie. I definitely think it was the most realistic, and I do really like it. Now, Friday Night Lights the movie, and Friday Night Lights the series completely different. Which, you know, I guess the movie is a lot more closely tied to the the Buzz Bissinger book. Um, but Friday Night Lights the movie I really like because I felt like it was pretty realistic. Um, Rob Phillips on you know comedies not quite being what they used to be definitely seems like there's a. V- it doesn't seem like there's many comedies and it doesn't seem like comedies are different. Now I'm also different now too. It's like when I was in my, you know, twenties, when some of these like, you know, really, you know, lo- well-loved comedies were coming out, you know, I probably liked a style of humor then that as a dad of small kids, I probably would not quite as, you know, be as into anymore. Um, but it does seem like, like you go try to find like a comedy, like I was watching, uh, uh, you know, couple of comedy type movies of the day thinking, yeah, this is not really what comedy used to be. I um definitely thought that. Um Jerry Popham checking out Jerry, we're glad you're here. Blair Davis says they need to make a movie about stats of Benny. It would be a good movie. It would be a good movie. And obviously we're rooting for that movie to have uh, a couple of more chapters for sure. Um uh, Corey Henderson enjoys the movie The Program. Uh that's going back to the nineties. I haven't seen that one in a while, but obviously I know how popular that was when it first came out. Um, uh, Jonathan Moore says that Steve Carell would be good in The Naked Gun. Yeah, he'd probably be pretty funny. Steve Carell's a funny guy. Funny guy. Uh, All right, let's bounce around the other comment section. Let me go back to dognation.com. Randy Hall says football movies. He likes Rudy, The Longest Yard, uh, the first one and the second. Remember the Titans, also a, a well loved football movie. You know that about that. Uh, Randy Hall was talking about people cheering in Endgame and all the Marvel characters appeared back again. It's funny to me how like not a part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe I am. Once again, it's not a boycott. I'm not like anti Marvel. It's just like my kids have never cared anything about that. I, I, like the entirety of like the sort of Marvel thing has sort of existed outside my orbit. It's amazing. Now, I would say we're sort of post-Marvel now. It seems like they haven't had a big movie in a good long time. But when those movies were at their most popular, um, it's amazing how not a part of that I was. Uh, Third Will says his girlfriend's a super fan of Tolkien, uh, of the whole Tolkien universe. She knows the whole universe and all the ages. I think I might need to investigate um, that. Uh, PDT says Top Gun Maverick. Yeah. So, uh, uh, love that movie. Saw it in the theater first weekend when it came out, like Memorial Day weekend. So much fun. Such a great experience. Kids have watched that. You know, um, I would say that, like, my son especially loves that movie because that's the first, what do you call it, like, non kid movie we let him watch. And so that's kind of a big deal for him. Yeah. So, love, love all of that. Uh, let's see what else. Dogs only agrees with me about keeping the sports records separate. And, you know, once again, that's not meant to be a slight to either side. It's just, it just, it has never made sense to me why we would combine, you know, sports like that. Just that has never made sense. DT says he saw Oppenheimer. So I kind of want to see that, although I suspect, like, what I don't want to do is spend three hours on that to only be like, eh, you know, I don't know. Um, and something tells me I might not like that, but, um, but I don't know. Let's see what else over on YouTube for a moment. Baggins and friends mentioning Barney Miller. So I remember that sitcom. I think I said this the other day. There's a lot of shows. The only thing I know about them is the song because I used to know every, because when you're a kid like that, you just, you know, this is what we had. 
And so, like, I, I couldn't tell you anything about Barney, Barney Miller. I know they were, like, cops or whatever. But, man, that little doom, 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 that little bass in the, uh, in the intro, I remember that, like, crazy. Could not tell you the first thing about any of it. I don't even know what network it was on, uh, if it was funny or not. Like, didn't none of that was in any way made any sense. But I do remember that little bass, doom, 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 you know, uh, uh, intro, the intro song. Daniel Nelson says Liam Neeson is actually pretty funny. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I've, I've heard he does have some comedy chops, and so I'm guessing this could have a chance to be pretty funny. Lance D says uh, Barney Miller's theme song gave birth to so many bass players. Yeah, I think that actually is true. I kind of, I, I kind of remember that. Uh, Jermaine King says Quincy Jones created the Barney Miller theme. We have so many audience people who know so many good things about pop culture. And Jermaine King is terrific. A lot of y'all have seen Jermaine's, uh, you know, Golden Shoe submissions over the years. He's a ta- talented like, animator or whatever. Um, uh, very, very good, Jermaine. I appreciate that. That's, that's good information. Um, Jonathan Aaron says that, uh, major league is an underrated baseball movie. Yeah. Uh, that's a classic for sure. Classic for sure. Um, Alan Hampton says the 1953 movie crazy legs, uh, her, she played himself. So, you know, one of the movies, I know this makes me sound like I'm just the biggest dork in the world, but one of the movies I've always loved because I used to watch it with my grandfather is uh, Pride of the Yankees, which is about Lou Gehrig. Gary Cooper plays Lou Gehrig. But in that movie, uh, Babe Ruth plays himself. Like this is, I mean, it's a, I just love this movie. And like I said, I know that makes me seem like just the biggest dork on the planet. I love this movie um, because it's like Babe Ruth is playing himself. It's like you're watching Babe Ruth in the movie. Um, another movie where, the original Jackie Robinson movie, did Jackie Robinson play himself in that movie? I think that may be, I think that may have been true. The original Jackie Robinson movie, there's been obviously another movie made about him in you know contemporary times, but I think the original Jackie Robinson movie, I believe he played himself. Um, let's see what else. Spencer Clark says everybody loves the original Lion King. I'll tell you this, back in the 90s, everybody saw the Lion King. Like, everybody saw that. And so if you're my age, you know, it's like, in the 80s, Disney was not that big. Um, like, I'm talking about, you know, like, sort of, there's a little bit of a lull. Like, I think this is, like, right before uh, uh, Michael Eisner became CEO. There, like, just a little bit of a lull in terms of, like, big, like, impact movies. You know, a lot of, the, 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 a lot of their big movies were all from, like, the 50s. But in, like, 89, Little Mermaid comes out. I think it's Beauty and the Beast comes out two years later, three years after that, two or three years after that, Lion King comes out. And so, like, the, the sort of Disney that we think of, you know, kind of all happened sort of post my childhood. Um, let's see what else. Um, Spencer Clark says he went on the Nick Saban documentary. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be something like that at some point in time. Um, Let's do a couple of more. We're going to bounce out of here for today. Baggins and Friends says that Brian's song, best football movie, certainly a very, very, I mean, well, I don't really know the movie all that well. I just know, like, it's just well known for being very, very sad, right? And at some point in time, I do want to watch that. Um, uh, but very, very sad movie, obviously, reflecting what Brian Piccolo and his friendship with Gail Sayers. Um. Alan Hampton says, yeah, Jackie Robinson does play himself in that movie. So there you go. You never know what we're going to get into in our R.S. Andrews cool down. Randy Hall on the subject of Jaws. That's another one of those movies I've seen probably 9 million times. Just love Jaws. Love Jaws. Um, Brian Scarborough says, Killer is a Flower Moon, also a pretty good movie that came out. That's another one that's like 15 hours long, too, right? It's like I'm just really, really hesitant to invest that kind of time into a movie unless I know it's going to be good. Um, all right. Anything else before we go for today? Uh, fun conversation. We're obviously Blair Davis says Ty Cobb was uh, from Athens. Um, yeah, Ty Cobb, the George Peach, the George Peach. 
All right, good stuff, y'all. We're going to wrap it up for today. Hey, we'll come back tomorrow. We'll have some fun. Spring practice is here. We're all over it. So uh, y'all check out R.S. Andrews online at rsandrews.com for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, electric needs. They show up on time. They do the work that's promised, the price is promised. You can trust them on all of that. Hope you have a great, great day. Check out R.S. Andrews. Get your air conditioning unit tuned back up to factory fresh specs. You know, it's you know, daylight savings time now. You got Easter's on the way. Spring practice is here. That means warm weather's coming too. So go ahead and get your air conditioning tuned up to factory fresh specs. They'll take good care of you on that. You'll have a great day. Back here tomorrow, Dog Nation Daily, presented by Palo Window and Door of Georgia. We'll look forward to talking to you then.